Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 16th, 2016, and my guest is Mike Munger of Duke University. I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org. And in the upper left-hand corner, please click on the link for the survey to let us know your favorite episodes of 2016 and give us some other feedback. Thank you so much. Mike, welcome back. Always a pleasure, Russ. Our topic for today is big, the basic income guarantee. What is it and how would it work? The basic income guarantee is a substitute for all other welfare programs. And the one argument for it is that, well, there's really two arguments for it and three arguments against. We'll probably get into it. But the two arguments for are this is a kind of social insurance and in an uncertain, maybe increasingly uncertain society where markets uh, benefit most of us, but harm some people often through no faults of their own because we're not very good at forecasting the future. We're better off if we can provide a certain minimum level of income for everyone, both politically and just on the merits. The other argument is we're doing this already and we're doing it inefficiently. So if we start from where we are, then if we consolidate all of the different dogs breakfast of welfare programs that we have into one and instead of hectoring people to do what we want them, we just give them the cash and say, here's what you've got. Do your best. Some people will make good choices. Some people will make bad choices. But overall, it'll be cheaper for those of us that are making these contributions into the welfare system through taxes. And the people that we care about will get more of it. Uh, and the, was that two arguments in favor? Yeah, the what two arguments – Right into the to to make it clear, it was a bunch of words. One argument in favor is that we should do this on the merits because there's a lot of uncertainty in the system. And as you've talked about on some uh, econ talks recently, um, when we say trade benefits everyone, that's not exactly true. A globalized system of capitalism does benefit many people, but it harms others because they lose their jobs. There's these movements of different industries. And so we'd like to have a sort of level of insurance that makes all of us, not almost all, but all of us benefit from the surplus that's created by having an efficient global system. Full stop. Second argument is, look, we're doing this already. We're just doing it badly. And so a a big would be more efficient. We're going to get into whether how badly we're doing it, because I think uh, some of the badness of that is misunderstood. But let's talk about some uh, practical um, implementation. How would this literally work? I don't mean who would literally send out the check. I mean, what are people talking about in terms of magnitudes across the the spectrum here? Well, it, it's hard to keep the two issues separate on those grounds if you're going to ask how it's going to work. Because one of the things that I want to advocate is that we eliminate all of the other welfare programs. And this could range from anything from uh, aid to families with dependent children to minimum wages. So the we would eliminate all of the other forms of welfare that, that go to income insurance, not health care. Health care is a separate thing. But all the, all the things that go to uh, income support and we would have to have some way of providing a monthly or quarterly check. Now, I have argued that we already have an infrastructure for doing this, and that is the income tax. The income tax in the United States is handled by the Internal Revenue Service, and every year on your tax return, you have to declare uh, a personal exemption, a standard deduction. And that amount, I think, right now is about $1,200, All that uh, basic income would do would be to change that to about $15,000 and make it a credit. So if you don't earn enough income to have to pay taxes, you would receive a check rather than having to send in a check. So it would be administered through the existing Internal Revenue Service, and all it would really involve is a change in the standard deduction. So every American 
of a certain age, perhaps, or every American, different ways you could do it, yeah. get a fixed the same fixed amount. Let's say let's say fifteen thousand dollars. Yes, that's very that's a lot of money. It would, and for many of us, we'd have to change the tax rate so as to make it uh, revenue neutral. So we'd have to do some changing in the tax rates or the levels where the new margins come in to make it revenue neutral. So there'd be no net effect on me. I would just get a larger standard deduction and then my taxes would go up to offset that. But for people who don't have jobs or don't have enough income where they're paying taxes, there would be a credit and they would receive, they would receive a check rather than paying in a check. So you're going to, so for me and you, we're going to raise taxes because we're fortunate enough to be gainfully employed, make a lot of money, um, and therefore we would still get the fifteen thousand. It's just that our tax rates would go up to offset that. Is that the idea? That's it. And so for for most people, there would be no net effect. Well, there'd be no net effect on maybe the amount sent back and forth, but there is a marginal effect of those higher tax rates, right? So our tax rates would have to go up quite a bit. To generate not, not that, that much, not that much, because remember that much of the revenue would come from, I said it was hard to separate, much of the revenue is going to come from eliminating the other programs. Yeah, but that's much smaller than what we currently spend. No, we spend, since it's, that, that, that's fair enough. The, there, there are two questions. The question you're asking is, in order to make it revenue neutral for the rest of us, marginal tax rates have to go up to offset the move from 1200 to 15000 That's right. So to make that clear, just to talk about what people worry about, and I, I'm not going to argue that this is a um, a central problem with it. I don't think this is the central – I think there are other problems with it. But let's just talk with about this one for a moment because it gets talked about a lot. There's the so-called disincentive effect of higher marginal tax rates. So let's say your marginal tax rate uh, is something like uh, – let's say it's it's 35%. Uh, because when you combine state and local, et cetera, for whatever income level gets you 35%, uh, that means if you earn an extra dollar, you only get to keep 65 cents of it. The other 35 cent goes to the go- cents goes to the government. Then the issue would be that discourages you – from it already discourages you from finding extra work or working a little harder or working extra hours. And if you raise that to, say, 50, uh, it would get discouraged even more. So there would be some – well, uh, we're talking we're talking three or four percent. The amount that would be required would be about the three or four percent. So it would go from thirty five so. to thirty nine or forty. I don't think so. That's not what I see when when I look at discussions of this. Maybe it's a question of of how it's structured. Uh, critics have suggested it's much larger than that, but uh-huh. we, we can put that to the side that for the moment because I think well, there, there's no question it's an increase, and at the margin, it's a disincentive for yeah. people who already have jobs to work more. The, the advantage is that right now the marginal tax rates on the very poor is well over 100%, and it would be reduced to the marginal tax rate, which for most of them is very close to zero. So we'll talk so, – let's talk about that, about the 100% thing, because I think that's confusing to most people. Explain well, suppose why. I live in Section 8 housing that's subsidized, and I get welfare benefits of various types. So I get money for my children. I get unemployment I get subsidies for heat. I lose all of those things if I get a job or in the case of if I'm female, if I get married. So I am being paid by the state not to work and not to get married. And the first dollar that I earn maybe doesn't have much of an effect. The first few thousand that I learn, I actually lose at least that much in benefits. So the marginal effect that I'm worried about right now is Very poor people have no way of getting jobs or getting married, starting a family, doing the things that we associate with responsible behavior without losing all of their benefits. And the reason that basic income, which is actually a head tax, economists always say that head taxes are the most efficient because there's no distortion effects. Or small. Yeah, they're they're much they're much smaller. So the income the big is a negative income tax. Forgive me, a negative head tax, which means that I don't lose it no matter how much money I earn. And so the incentive effects that I'm worried about more than you working less from a three or maybe even 10 percent increase in taxes is the, the, the effective marginal tax rates on the very poor more than 100 percent. 
And if we reduce that, a lot of poor people will start working more. And it matters that they become part of society and support themselves and see themselves as having a, a stake in society because they have jobs instead of being paid not to work. So I have a lot of issues with this. So I, some of them are conceptual, some philosophical, um, and you might be able to convince me. We'll see. But I, I want to get a couple of things straight because I think there's some confusion uh, in most of the discussions I read about this. So when you say the tax rates are over 100 percent, it's not strictly true that – which would be a polite way of saying you're, I disagree with you. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's true that – uh, when you get a job, you lose huge parts of your uh, aid package. There are some aid. There is some aid. There are some aid programs that are contingent on work versus not work, but most of them have implicit marginal tax rates. That is, as you earn more, as you work, as you get a raise, your benefits go down. They don't disappear. They don't disappear for a long time. Meaning, a long you have to earn a lot of money before they go away totally. And those are put in place for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about. But the point is, I think you're exaggerating the idea that somehow we're paying people enormous sums of money not to work. We're paying people a little bit not to work, and then we're paying some more to discourage them from working. But there's still an incentive to work. And your claim, I think, to be more honest about it is that this would make uh, the incentive to work larger in some sense, that is at the margin, that is, if you earn more, you would still get to keep your $15,000 in the example we're using. But it also, of course, discourages you working because it pays you $15,000. So there's an income effect there. There is an income effect, and I'm not as worried about income effects as I am about the substitution effect of forcing people to uh, – forcing, encouraging people to substitute leisure because the price, the amount that they get – particularly for very poor people. And the, 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 the thing that we might disagree about is how to measure the effects of things that are more qualitative, like do I qualify or not for Section 8 housing, for subsidized housing? And then there's just a cutoff. If I earn more than a certain amount, I'm done. If I earn more than a certain amount, I am not eligible for uh, reduced price lunches for my child. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's called a cliff effect. So it's for the very poor. The cliff effect means that if I earn above a certain amount, I just lose all of those qualitative benefits. Now, I'm trying to treat to, to treat that as if we can think of it at the margin, and you may be right. Maybe we shouldn't do that. But one thing that you said I think we can agree on, my claim, right or wrong, is that a big would have fewer disincentives to work than the current program. That's the heart of the claim. Yeah, that's true if income effects are relatively small. Um, well, no, the, the substitution effect. The income effect, I'm just not that concerned about. I think that many people want to work and just can't or can't get started. So what we might disagree about is how lazy the poor are. I don't think they are lazy. I don't want to disagree about that at all, and I don't think I don't think that's the issue. I think – Of I th course, I'm being tendentious. Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, it's a cheap shot, actually, I would say. Yeah, more than, yeah. Uh, a really ugly cheap shop, but I, the point I want I want to stress is that I, I, let me say, let me say it a different way. I think it's really important to remember what the actual current programs to help the poor are like. And in my discussions I've read of big of the basic income guarantee, those programs are are, are I think either exaggerated or misdescribed. So let me make a couple points, and you can agree or disagree. Number one. Most people don't get much money if they don't work in America right now. There's not this raft of of, of welfare programs for non-workers. If you're a woman with a child, you have some opportunities. But a single man uh, doesn't have a great life in America right now unless, unless that person has a job. You're eligible for food stamps. You can get Medicaid. But you don't have a stipend. Uh, and nope. it's – right? It's – Right. It's very tough. So yeah. we are we are we distinguish between types of people right now. And the other thing that's really important that I think is grossly misunderstood is that we transfer a lot of money to people who are technically not poor. That is food stamps and many other programs, lunch programs, etc. explicitly give money to people who are above the poverty line or above what you would call uh I would to say it more uh, uh, conceptually, it, they transfer money 
to people who are well above the level we'd like to transfer money to. But we do that because we have to phase these the benefits out slowly as income rises because otherwise there will be these cliff effects that you're talking about. So there are cliff effects, but they're diminished by the fact that they've, they're phased out slowly over the income range. And they therefore give lots of money to non-poor people. So when people say the current programs are very ineffective at helping the poor, that's because they're designed that way. And they're designed that way for a reason. It's not just a ineptitude on the part of the government. It's a very uh, reasonable idea that you don't want to discourage work effort, not just to save money. Well, that's part of the reason, but also just to um, – Well, for a whole bunch of reasons. And so lots of non-poor people benefit from programs that are designed for the poor. And to try to suggest that we can save all this money because we'll only give money to the poor now, I think is – excuse me, because we give money to everybody and then we'll save all that money that we used to give to the poor. And therefore, the poor can be a lot better off than we were before, I think is is, is bad accounting. As you know, the usual and overly simplistic form of the argument is we add up everything that we spend on welfare programs, programs for the poor, divide it by the number of poor people and say there shouldn't be any poor people. All we have to exactly. do is give them the cash. That's what Milton Friedman argued, by the way. Uh, and in, Charles in, Murray yeah. and the, all of the many people who have argued for a negative income tax or basic income. Uh, that Why not do that? Why not say – Let's and that I, we're, I realize we're getting into what you said. We're going to hold constant, but we're, we're going to leave aside. But the, we're spending an awful lot of money that doesn't get there. So we have the leaky bucket problem. If we could reduce the cost of administration, and many of those costs of administration are to make sure that people spend things the right way. Instead of giving the cash, we give things in vouchers, or we give things in forms to make sure that they spend it the right way, and. You can see the argument for that because we're worried that we want poor people to spend it on what we want because – and by we, I mean experts who are concerned about their objective welfare, thinking that if you give them the cash, they'll spend it on something else. Now, that sort of paternalism I think is problematic, but it's not obviously false. So one problem with this is the idea we'll give them the cash instead of the services. The other is, if you add up all the costs of the services, can you really recover that and convert it into a check? Yeah, well, my point is is that what I think when you say administrative costs, I think people used to think of the costs of paying the bureaucrats who move the money around. And that cost, as I understand it, is trivial. It's not zero. It's not irrelevant, but it's not going to generate a lot of these inefficiencies of having multiple programs and multiple bureaucracies. Those those so-called inefficiencies are relatively small. Uh, the other point I'd make is that it's not just what the experts want. It's a public choice program, in my view. It's public choice effect. Taxpayers don't want to subsidize yeah. certain types of things, and that's just straightforward. Yeah, um, yeah the, the the welfare queen is an important trope. So the person who the person on welfare pulls up in the Cadillac, buys steak and cigarettes. Uh, doesn't happen very often, but it is uh, an important public choice argument that. You have this deal where maybe some people on the left, let's say, honestly care about making sure that the poor get something, but others are concerned that, well, we need to have them spend it the right way. I don't want my money wasted, and so we impose all these restrictions. But the bottom line is – let's go back now to the logistics of the budget problem. Bottom line is you're going to transfer – $15,000, $20,000 Fifteen, ten, twenty thousand dollars per person to people who are not poor. I think you have to raise people's taxes a lot more than you think. But that's not the most interesting aspect of this. Let's put that to the side because just to make it clear how why people are suggesting this, one answer would be, well, yeah, it's silly to transfer money to everybody. Let's just transfer it to poor people. So why is this argument put in this this framework of well, everybody would get would get the check? There's two reasons. One is to try to control the public choice problem, which you have already raised, and that is if we take money from some and give it to others, we're creating a kind of rent-seeking contest to make sure that you're in the receive group and not in the take-from group. Whereas if everybody gets it, then we've the incentives for rent-seeking are much reduced because if we increase it, we have to increase it for everyone. And 
Friedrich Hayek made this observation about the universalism principle. There's a very nice book by Buchanan and Congleton on politics by, by principle, not interest, where they follow up Hayek's idea that almost any transfer that we make, as long as it goes to everyone, can be justified because this is something that we're not using to discriminate. Now, you might or might not accept that argument, but it is a limit both on the public choice problem of rent seeking and on the, the it, it helps solve the ethical problem of redistribution. But that's not the only reason people want to give it to everybody. And I think the main reason people want to give it to everybody is that if you quote, if you only give it to quote poor people, you have this immense cliff problem. So if you say, well, anybody who earns less than twenty five thousand dollars a year gets uh, gets twenty five gets twenty five thousand, then you basically people who earn more than who earn thirty or twenty seven, they're working for hugely, they're working a huge amount to get two thousand dollars. Yeah, but and we could we could smooth that if you wanted. You so could. if we were going to discriminate it, we could we could have once you get to. The poverty level, then you wouldn't get dollar for dollar, and maybe we could smooth it out all the way up to a hundred thousand. Yeah, so, so that we could smooth it. Yeah, I don't know why that isn't the more common proposal. Because most uh, people, I'm just talking about marketability now. If you say to people, "We need a new government program that gives everybody twenty thousand dollars," most people would say, "Well, why would rich people need to get twenty thousand dollars?" Yeah, and, and I think then, they've got a point. <laughs> right, and then then my response is, "Well, we'll f we'll fiddle with tax rates." And then you say, but wait, there's there's incentive problems then. Why not smooth it out? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm not sure the fiddle with tax rates thing works as as easily as, as you do, but let's Right, it's a, that's a separate problem, yes. Yeah. And I I'm conceding that it's a problem. Okay, so let's let's um let's summarize. We're we're talking about this idea that every single person would get a fixed amount. Uh it might be ten, it might be fifteen, it might be twenty. Could could um could I – and I've never heard this talked about. Could I refuse my check if I don't want it? Of course. All you have to do is not cash it. Yeah, or not – I guess it would be not claim the standard deduction. It would be weird in your version of it. It's a weird thing to uh, – yeah, one of the stranger things I find about Social Security is that we, we have this illusion. I've mentioned this many times, but it bears repeating. We have this illusion that it's a program for me, that I, they take my money when I earn – my paycheck and it gets put aside for me. And of course, that's not true. It goes out the door to pay for not just the retirement benefits of current retirees, but also government spending right now because there's a yeah. surplus that may change. We expect that to change soon as baby boomers get older and retire and become more numerous. But the, the point is, is that so security for me, it, it's a welfare program that I also get am eligible for. So when I get a little bit older, I think actually now since I'm 62, I could start getting it, and I, I don't really feel like I should. I, I didn't. I didn't. I never had the illusion when I was working when I was younger that I was putting this aside the money for my future retirement. When I suggest to people that uh, Social Security should be means tested, they say, "Well, I contribute it," and I said, "Well, yeah, but you contribute to yeah. food stamps too when you pay your taxes. Yeah. You don't say, where's my food stamp money?' Because you understand the purpose of the program." is to help poor people, not to help everybody, because that's nuts. But, but, ev but everybody gets Social Security. You're right. Which is that's nuts. a good analogy. <laughs> the, the point is, everybody gets it. The fiction is that everybody gets it, and that somehow you're paying into an account, and then later you get it. But it's a defined benefit program. There's, there's some relationship, but not a very clear relationship between what you pay and what you take out. There's a huge redistributive component, which is to help yeah. poor people who didn't contribute much when they, who didn't contribute hate that word who weren't taxed as much when they were younger. Yeah. But if you ask people, this is crazy. This is a mistake. The program's about to go broke. Uh, we need to do something isn't the obvious thing to to means test it. And people say, no, we can't do that because then it would reduce the support for the program. Then everybody wouldn't love it because it wouldn't be helping them. And I'm thinking, but it's an illusion. I, so I yeah. find that I don't have a way out of that box. I don't well, it's, it's already means tested in a way because there's a ceiling on the amount of taxes. So once you pay a certain amount in, so it's actually it's means tested kind of in the wrong direction. But they've so changed that over of, time. They've raised it. Yeah, they it. did. They, but for a long time, the, yep. the total amount that you paid was capped. And 
that meant that you still got Social Security, but the amount that you paid in was capped. What you're saying is there's a relatively small number of wealthy people. Well, let me let me let me put it this way. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could opt out of Social Security? If, if you what you're saying is for most people, you get back more than you put in. Why not be able to opt out of Social Security? Why not be able to opt out of participating in the if there were a, a, a big, if there were a basic income grant, uh, to say, I don't want to participate, I don't want to contribute, and I don't want to get the money. And I think the concern would be that it would just devolve and that many people would not participate. Yeah, I don't know. Which, I, I like the better idea of saying you can participate, but you don't have to you don't have to accept the money. So there are many, many people who are not poor, have a very small chance of being poor, who are happy to have some part of their taxes go to help poor people. They may have preferences about how that money is spent, but they certainly don't need to have it kept for themselves. So the idea of having it um, a program that everybody gets ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars seems to me to be a major uh, tax uh, marginal tax rate nightmare. You disagree? You think it's smaller than I think? But I just think it's. I think it's quite large. We agree it's big. We agree it's significant. Well, I don't think four percentage points is significant. I think it's. Well, no, but whatever it's going to be is going to be significant. We disagree on the amount. Even four percent is enough, and maybe it's seven, ten, or twenty. I mean, it's it's it's. Um, there are a lot of people alive right now, and we're giving every one of them fifteen thousand dollars. It seems to me where government's going to get a lot bigger. Um. And therefore, marginal tax rates are going to have to go up a lot. And it just seems bizarre that you would advocate – anybody would advocate doing that. It seems to me the much better program would be to be what was originally proposed by Friedman in I think uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. And then he wrote about it in Capitalism and Freedom. Freedom. And I think Robert Lampman also proposed it at the University of Wisconsin – this idea that you would you would not everybody gets twenty thousand dollars that's ridiculous. A person who has nothing might get twenty thousand dollars, but it would slowly decline as you earn more and more per year until you, after say as you said maybe it's a hundred thousand dollars you would then get zero. But why anyone who earns over a hundred thousand has to get twenty thousand seems bizarro to me. I guess I guess at that point maybe it's such a small number of people is not so important. It's really that whole effect over the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range that people are worried about. Maybe I don't know. And the, the the reduction in the amount that you get also is a disincentive effect. It may be really? less than the increase in the marginal tax. So that it, it, there's certainly there's a, a down in the weeds. There's a bunch of problems with this. The main part of the argument that I want to advance is that the current system has bad incentive effects for the very poor, having the amount not be immediately at least tied to the the amount that you receive is not immediately tied to the amount of outside income you get from other sources is the main thing that I'm worried about. The other details we maybe we could work out. But what I'm what I'm worried about is to reduce the the qualitative disincentives for people to take the first step up that stairway. And you rightly said that it was a dirty cheap shot about the poor being lazy, but I want to raise it and I want to raise it again because I worry that we don't give people enough credit. And we lose quite a few people now that without these disincentives and minimum wages that prevent them from having a job and getting experience for the very, very poor people that don't have much education, a big part of my argument is we could get rid of minimum wage laws. I don't know how you value that. But getting rid of minimum wages would have effects that are going to be hard to measure, but that I think would be very positive. Well, I agree with that. The question is, uh, let's talk about this disincentive issue, because, and let's broaden the whole thing, because that's where I want to head, which is the following. And you've written about this uh, in unpublished work, uh, maybe even in published work, and certainly a lot of people are talking about it, which is this issue of it's possible that in the future uh, a lot of people are going to struggle to find work. Um, right now we're pretending to take care of them through a program like disability. So as we've talked about on the program before, disability has been, uh, made a lot more accessible to people. I, you know, it's ironic. The workplace is much safer than it was 25, 50, a hundred years ago. Yet somehow more people are disabled. And that's because we've changed the ease with which you can claim disability. We can debate how important that is, but the point is, is that there are a lot more. This is undeniable. There are a lot more people who are paid 
a check from the government who don't work, who are not women with children, who are typically men in the case of disability. Uh, I probably a good chunk of them are single men. And um, a lot of people would say, let's just make this more open. Let's not worry about the disincentive effects of the minimum wage if they're there. I think they're there, but some people don't. But let's admit, let's say, assume that they're, they're there. Let's not have to worry about the technological changes of artificial intelligence that are coming that will make, say, the current cab drivers and truck drivers unemployable after or greatly unemployable having given them a very hard time to find a job after driverless cars and trucks come along. We're going to have a massive social problem is the claim. And the right way to do that is just give these people money. And I think that's deeply appealing to a lot of people. And I want to ask you, is that deeply appealing to you? Forget all this stuff about the current poverty programs. A lot of people would agree with you. And I would too, that they would be better structured to be just cash based, not in kind, but we're talking about more than that. We're talking about expanding Way beyond, uh, say, women with children. We're talking way beyond, say, temporary unemployment insurance. We're talking way beyond relatively ungenerous disability. We're talking about a just don't worry. This is the ultimate safety net. It's, you know, we're going to make sure that no one has a problem uh, meeting b- basic needs. And if that comes out of the government and the taxpayer, that's fine, as opposed to charity, as opposed to an incentive to work. That's what's on the table. And I want, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think the way you put it is exactly the right way to put it. In fact, it's the, it's the way that I would have. We There's two kinds of programs that we use to try to mitigate the impacts of globalization and the fast-moving changes in maybe the, uh, the, the sharing economy. So uh, Mark Andreessen, whom you've had on the show, uh, wrote in November 2011 – an article in the Wall Street Journal, the title of which was Software Eats the World. And the problem is that software is to service industries as robotics and automation is to uh, industrial production. So all we, we used to say, yes, we're losing all these production jobs, but there will still be work in service. Well, no. Software can take over all these service jobs. So uh, truck drivers, cab drivers, people who work in restaurants, all of those things can potentially be done by software. The person at the desk, at the uh, the, the checkout counter at the Walmart, uh, you may be able just to do self-checkout. So all of these jobs may very well be lost to software, just as we saw so many jobs lost to automation uh, in factories. Well, so the question is how to handle that. You mentioned that there's two things that we do now. One of them is uh, we call trade adjustment assistance or in in an attempt to make places like Fort Payne, Alabama, where people used to make socks. Now we have adjustment assistance and we try to teach people, you know, some other kind of trade. 50-year-old person that didn't graduate from college who worked in the sock factory for 20 years and assumed that that's what they were going to do forever. That's a pretty big harm to them. It's tempting to say, well, we need trade protection. And in fact, that's the direction that we're going is we're going to have trade protection because all these people lost their jobs. They're made now abroad. We've shipped our jobs abroad. I don't think any of that's true. What we've done is lost our jobs to productivity, some of which comes from software. But the question is, how can we insulate people politically from that? So one thing is trade adjustment assistance. The other thing, and you mentioned it, is disability. And disability is probably the most pernicious kind of welfare program that I can think of that makes the best argument for a big Disability has two really bad corrosive aspects. One is it's a rent-seeking contest. If I can hire a lawyer and pay that person $5,000, I've got a pretty good shot. There's towns in Alabama where one-third of the people are on Social Security disability because they had skilled representation. A bunch of people are spending a lot of time winning this rent-seeking contest, but suppose you win. Disability means that they're going to pay me for the rest of my life not to work. And if I work, not only do I lose my benefits, I get arrested. So we're making sure that people can't possibly find any other kind of gainful employment. So it's the Hayekian nightmare. In Chapter 9 of Road to Serfdom, uh, Hayek talks about security. 
And the two kinds of security that he talks about is one, we're going to guarantee people's current income, which is terrible. The other is we're going to guarantee a certain level of uh, living that means that they can survive even if they're subject to forces, which through no real fault of their own, they have lost their jobs. And that's the way that creative destruction works. It's very difficult to predict. Now we can say maybe they should have predicted better, but one of the Hayekian observations is it's hard to predict that in a dynamic economy, the people who are investing have a hard time predicting. You can't really expect line workers to be able to predict very well uh, what sort of business should I go into and develop skills in. But disability is it prevents people from making any kind of adjustment. So getting rid of disability, getting rid of trade adjustment assistance. And remember, we're talking about $15,000. $15,000, I really can't imagine trying to live on $15,000 a year. It's not that much. It just means that the 15000 I wouldn't lose it if I get a job and make another ten or 20000 that I try to use to improve my life and the life of my family. Yeah, well, so that- you're absolutely right about the disability problem. That's, that really is an important one. We're locking people in, though, and a big would not do that. And we would get rid of all of the apparatus. We may disagree about this. We have a big apparatus for judging whether people qualify for these benefits if you count disability and some of the other trade adjustment assistance. Yeah, just it's important to remember trade adjustment assistance is for reasons that are not well understood by me or maybe anyone. It's a very small program. In yeah. principle, we have a program to help people who lose their jobs because of globalization, which you could debate whether that should exist or whether it's a good idea. It does exist. And for reasons that I don't fully understand, it's very small. Uh, yeah. Many people who qualify for it either don't know about it or choose not to use it. So it's not a very um, – it's not an effective cushion against the globalization effects that, that many people are worried about and for reasons that I don't fully understand. But if we talked about a big as an alternative to that plus, say, disability plus the minimum wage plus – their income income tax credit plus food stamps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other issue is you just said 15000 is a small amount of money. That's why it's not going to stay at 15000 You really think that – you say this is not going to be so much rent-seeking? You don't think there's going to be rent-seeking by people trying to make it twenty and twenty five? Well, the, that is the argument for giving it to everyone. It would be too expensive to raise it much. Yeah. Now, but this is generally a good argument. It's a good counter argument, and I think you could expand it. So let me – I'm interrupting you, but you made the first step in this argument. So remember, my idealized claim is we get rid of all of these other programs. We combine all of them into a big, and we fix the big at the current poverty level, and we're done. We walk away, and we never touch this again. Well, that's asinine. I don't think anyone actually believes that. Politicians cannot get reelected by saying, I promise to do nothing. And so it's like the 1986 Tax Reform Act. There's a great book about the 86 Tax Reform Act called uh, Showdown at Gucci Gulch, where a bunch of tax rates were cut, but even more revenue was created by getting rid of many loopholes and set-asides and little special tax treatment. So the result was revenue neutral or maybe even a slight revenue increase. The problem is that over time, that Christmas tree of dispensations has been decorated again. And so you're right. There is a really big problem with my argument, and that is that over time, we'd have a big I don't think what would happen is that we'd raise the big. I think what would happen is we'd get a bunch of other programs tacked back on top of it. And a lot of the beneficial effect that I'm claiming would disappear, even if it exists, which is debatable. Well, let's move to the philosophical question. And, I, you know, it's a little awkward. Um, you know, my view is I prefer private efforts to help poor people, private efforts to help people who are out of work because of technology or trade. And by private efforts, I mean things that we don't see right now because there's no reason for them to exist because we have such extensive uh, public efforts. So charities that give people money uh, or take care of them or give them skills uh, are very thin, and that's because there's a lot of government activity. And so people generally are not going to donate money to a charity that uh, tries to do what the government already does. I'm already funding that through my taxes. I have no – reason to fund it through private efforts. Now, when you say that, 
people say, yeah, well, there's a free rider problem. So talk about that, uh, why there, people make that argument. So, I'm, Well, I'm deeply conflicted about this. So as long ago as 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville in his book, Democracy in America, talked about the difference between France and the U.S. He was worried that democracy in France, when this is his word, would enfeeble the impulses that people have to join private associations and to say, here's a problem, we should do something about it. In a democracy, or at least the kind of democracy that Tocqueville saw in France, basically people just say, I gave it the office, or you know, I paid my taxes. So as, since as, I pay taxes, I have no reason to participate in this. There's a school, and somebody should should work on this. Yeah, you're right. The state should do that. I see someone getting beaten up in the street or someone who's very poor. Well, the state should do something, but I have no obligation to do it. Well, Tocqueville thought that that wasn't happening in the United States. Suppose we really did institutionalize this in the way that I'm arguing that we should. There is the problem that then people would say, we have a lavish program. You get all this money. You must have wasted it. I don't feel any obligation to participate in giving to charity and working on problems of homelessness because it's your fault. We all we already paid our taxes. I think that's a legitimate objection that I I think that many people have the perception that the existing welfare programs – are sufficiently large that we already that ship has already sailed. Oh, but I agree I do with think that. that it, I, I think that's that. a problem. I agree with that. I think you know that our, that ship has sailed. It sailed in nineteen oh around thirty three, thirty five actually. And I I wrote one of the only interesting papers I ever wrote as an academic is that paper. I'll put a link up to it. But basically, private charity in the United States, while still a very healthy sector, no longer goes to help poor people. Uh, it goes toward Education, people donate to their college. It goes towards medical things, hospital, wing at the hospital, uh, membership at the art museum. Uh, so people don't help poor people anymore because the government crowded all that out and did it long ago. And the but only you also, ex- Go ahead. You also mentioned the free rider problem, and that is suppose that I think we should all contribute voluntarily to the provision of a public good. And you know, charity is a public good, but I think you're not going to, so I'm not going to. Whereas if I could be assured that you were going to contribute, I would be willing also. And that's the role of the state is to enforce that agreement that we all have to pay our voluntary contributions, which become taxes and are no longer voluntary. I'm I'm not so sure that that part of the, the you know solving the free rider problem really works. I think what you just said about your paper, which is interesting, is – That has been attenuated over time anyway, and we have displaced our charitable impulses, not completely, but at the margin from the poor to art museums, to operas. So a lot of these are, we're just trying to make some contributions that wealthy or middle-class people already care about. And that's not really charity in the traditional sense. That's not, let's take care of those who can't help themselves. That's, let's provide a voluntary local public good because it's good for the community I belong to. Exactly. So the claim I want to push for a minute is that because we have gone through the state rather than voluntary, and people, let me make one point clear, People think we could never do it privately because of the free rider problem, and I agree the free rider problem reduces the amount people would donate, but they would still donate a lot. And the question is whether they would – that smaller amount than the public coerced taxing would be structured differently. And I want to make – just give – people say, well, that's ridiculous. No one would give. be so much smaller. Sort of make the observation that currently there are millions of dollars donated to support scholarships to private schools for poor people even though poor people can go to free schools right now. So it's really should have been crowded out. There's no reason. If you came to me and said, well, I'm collecting money to give uh, charity to poor people so they can afford a, a good school, you'd say, well, what do you mean? They already can afford have a good school. It's free. How can you – you'll never be able to raise any money for that. And yet people donate because they care and they and they have a passion to see people get educated and they give lots of money to get people out of the really bad public schools that they're in even though there's a free rider problem. So there's an issue then of magnitude, which I certainly concede. And the question is how, you know, how big would – so I'm not saying there's no free rider problem, but I'm saying a, a private charitable uh, fund or a group of them is viable. The question is how big would it be? The point I want to emphasize now is that it would be, I presume, different 
than the public aid, which is basically uh, no strings attached if you meet the criteria. Now, the criteria are weird and different and bizarre and can debate whether that's good or bad. But what you're advocating and what many people advocate, and this is the part I want to turn to now, is we need to go away from a world where we have all these weird bureaucracies and other things to try to figure out if you're qualified and you need a lawyer. And that, and I agree, let's get rid of all that. But to get rid of it by saying let's have a new program where there's no rules, just that you're alive and you get a $15,000 check might not work as well as a private solution that would give less but would be structured in, in, in a more customized way for, for the individuals. That's my claim. If we're talking that you know you and I are able to persuade people to move in that direction, I might very well go along. And what's sad about it is that in 1831, at least, that was what Tocqueville thought was the uniquely good feature of American society was we mostly did kind of solve that problem. We didn't worry so much about the free rider problem. We said, as long as I make a contribution, others will too. And that is an equilibrium. In fact, if all of us think that others are also participating, we're willing to participate. And if those expectations are fulfilled, it works. The problem is that if a bunch of people cheat, don't participate, I cheat, don't participate, having the state step in as an alternative is not a very good substitute. So if you and I and the others who think that could actually implement a program where private charities we're able to solve this problem, I guess I would be much less supportive of a big. My concern about what we see, what we have at present, is the combination of the programs that we have, minimum wage laws, and as you said, there are questions about minimum wage laws. Do they create unemployment? I think they do have an impact on many young people who otherwise don't have many opportunities to get any kind of experience, who don't have the chance to say, uh, I, I got up at 7.30 in the morning, I made it to work by 8, I've done it for two years, and if I work for you, uh, you can rely on me, and so you can actually pay something. So in, in Europe, they solve, They don't have minimum wage laws for the most part. What they have is internship programs or apprenticeship programs. So the United States, in the particular way that we have said we're worried about people getting enough money to live on, let's have minimum wages. We have singled out a particular part of our population that's most vulnerable. That's the population that might be well served by charity also. I don't disagree with you. I just worry about being able to make that kind of wholesale shift when even the shift I'm thinking about to a big is probably politically impossible. Yeah, I'll concede that my view is not carrying the day right now for sure. But I want to continue the philosophical point and and conversation. And again, I want to tilt it toward this issue of not just people who are poor today, say who are homeless, um, who are unemployable at the current, have not been able to find work at the current level of the minimum wage. I'm thinking, I'm worrying about, say, 20 years from now, when it is possible that there may be, may be very large uh, numbers of the American workforce that can't find work at all because of the role of artificial intelligence. And what I'm thinking about, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a little bit of a veil of ignorance here. So, you know, Rawls asks us to consider this idea that you don't know your place in the income distribution. You don't know whether you'll have some of the, the skills that may be relatively rare that'll allow you to, to have a very good job in 20 years, despite the increase in artificial intelligence, robotics, et cetera. So we're behind the veil of ignorance. You know, our, we're thinking about, uh, the way I like to think about it is let's take take one's brother. So your brother ha is, let's say, a cab driver, a truck driver, and uh, you know that in, say, five to ten years, let's say you're pretty confident that that your brother's not going to be able to use those skills anymore. And it may be that there's almost nothing else that's attractive. That's what, That's my worry, and it's possibly true. So how would you prepare for that? What would you want – what would you do for your brother who you love? Not everybody loves their brother, but let's say you do. Would you just say, you know, I know you're having a tough time, so I'm just going to give you 2000 I'm going to give you $1,500 um, a month. That's 18000 a year, and that way you don't have to worry about it. I know it's coming, and I'm, I'm lucky. My skills are not uh, devalued by technology. I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm healthy. 18000 a year is not a big deal for me. I'm going to give you 18000 That way you're going to make sure that you're – 
uh, you're going to be okay. You're going to be less worried. In fact, it might make it 24. Um, and we give you 2000 a month. I can afford it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. What do you think of that? Well, I think that many families probably have always operated that way. And it's only been in the last 50 years or so in the U.S., that we've seen government as a replacement for that. So 100, 150, 200 years ago, of course, that's exactly how a family would have operated. I don't know if it's better or not. Um, what the, the point that you're raising is suppose that many people felt that way. Wouldn't it be more efficient to operate it through a government program called the Basic Income Guarantee? And we act on that impulse collectively and solve the free rider problem. The, the, the secret that I have, and so I think you, you think that many of the claims that I've made so far are wrong. You're going to think this one's ridiculous, so I might as well go for the uh, the, the whole shebang. Trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think they're ridiculous. I just the whole thing makes me uneasy. Uh, no, you and, think and, they're ridiculous. And, That's fair enough. It's okay. Let's, let's own that, Russ. No, you, you and I'm, it's, it's not okay. ridiculous, and I'm uneasy about the fact that you know it's very easy. I, I have a very good financial monetary life. And my children probably will too. And it's it's uh, there's something a uh, little bit repulsive about hearing me say, "Oh, well, private charity will solve it." So I'm. Yeah, but at least you're not a tenured professor. I'm yeah, used to you, right. you. You actually went out into the private sector, so I'm, it, it is of. particularly <laughs> amazing to hear tenured yeah. professors talk about yeah, stuff right. like. Carry that. on. What else? Give me your latest ridiculous idea. Okay, the most ridiculous claim is that the big won't have to go up; it'll go down. And the reason is that I think that in the economy that we're heading towards, it is true that wages are going to fall, and for many people, they'll be near zero. Uh, but prices are going to fall by more, which means that real wages may actually go up. For Let me say that people. again. Yeah, for lots w of people. Wages are going to fall by some. Prices are going to fall dramatically. And I know you disagree about this, but mm -hmm. my claim is that being able to rent rather than own, have a more efficient use. I won't need to have a car. I'll be able to rent a car with a with driverless Uber. Um, the, I won't have to have garages. Our streets will be more efficient. There's all sorts of – so we're not just buying time, but we're also buying space. So the, the I'll be able to have smaller houses. The, the cities will be more efficient. The price of almost everything will fall. And we see this to some extent now. Facebook is nearly free. Uh, Twitter is nearly free. Google, Wikipedia, so many things that we used to have books for or servants, we now get essentially for free. If prices fall enough, then the amount of a big that will be required may not be so large. So I may be able to have a smaller apartment. It may be possible for me to have food delivered much more cheaply and efficiently than we're able to do it now. So the, my hope is that if that's true and we can compensate for the fact that wages are going to fall by making sure that everyone is able to get access to a now much cheaper set of basic services, bigs won't have to go up. They'll be able to fall. So there, I said it. I don't disagree with any of that, actually. I think the real purchasing power argument, the standard of living argument, I think is true. I do think there's going to be – there's still an enormous public choice issue, which I know you're aware of, about how people who are living great materially but don't get to go to, say, their own island in, uh, in the Caribbean uh, because they're on the big, whether that's going to have some difficult societal issues – Right. So somebody who makes a very, very low wage, but it goes very far compared to somebody who makes a really high wage that goes ridiculously far might be troubling. There may be some it's social issues. Absolutely. There. But a big makes that better than a system when we don't have some sort of easily available compensation in the form of cash. So I think you're right. But a big that's the argument. You just made the argument for the big. Uh Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, oh, because, well, oh with, my without mistake. It, oh, my with, mistake. Without it, it would be even worse. Maybe. You're absolutely right. That's so, way to go. No, so so let's go back to the uh, – you took my uh, my veil of ignorance argument in, in a very clever but not the direction I intended. So I'm going to come back to that. Uh, you made the point that the increase in government programs over the last century have – destroyed, I would the way I would describe it, have destroyed some of the bonds between us. I don't have to worry so much about my parents. 
Uh, I don't have to worry about my my siblings because there have been programs to take care of them. And other people yeah. would say the causation goes the other way because our connections to each other are not what they used to be. We need government programs to cushion uh, the blow and to make those connections for us or they'll argue. It's probably them. recursive. We we yeah. partly we partly dissolve the bonds and the dissolving bonds reduce the obligation. Yep. But I was going to make I was actually making a different point, which is I don't think I'd give my brother twenty four thousand dollars in cash as a way to soften the blow if he lost his job to a driverless car. I think I'd want to help him try to find an alternative strategy for meaning in his life than just say, oh, don't worry, you can live off me. Right. So the the really ugly way to put the big argument is life's hard for some people. And uh, so it's okay that they live off the rest of us because we have good lives. Our lives are meaningful. They're great. So we just need to get we need to give them comfort through money. And my view is that and this is my real problem with big. And it's not so much whether you know, taxes go up or it's inefficient or it's we should have uh, criteria for who gets it or what. The question is, is it really a good idea yep. to tell people that, oh, I mean, I don't know which is worse. I, I, it just strikes me as – I've lost my train of thought here, but I'm trying to make the point that the idea that somehow by giving people money will have solved the problems of of, of what makes life difficult in the 22nd century, say, is strikes me as the wrong way to go about thinking the, about the problem. The right way to think about it is what gives life meaning? And Adam Smith said it's – we want to be loved and lovely, and giving people money is the last thing to do to give people respect and dignity. Now, the question is, is there any other alternative? I'm, I'm willing to face that. If there's not, then I'm all for giving money because I don't think – I don't want to romanticize poverty. I'm not saying, oh, everybody needs to struggle. and My brother lost a job. He needs to go through the, the, the soul-searing experience of trying to remake himself. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it would be very tragic. To anyone losing a job is a tragedy. The question is, what's the right way to cope with that and say, oh, don't worry, here's a lollipop, just strikes me as ugly, at the same time saying, oh, uh, it's okay. it's good for you. You'll, you'll, you'll come out better for it. I'm not going to give you anything. That's also ugly. And I, when I make the case for a private program to do this, whether it's through my family or a different set of, of civil society institutions, I'm making the claim that those would have a different texture. It's not just that they would do the money more effectively. We don't disagree about the objective. What we disagree perhaps about is the means. And I'm going to go with the jobs are overrated claim. It is true that for a relatively brief period of human history, at most 150 years, really only about 100 years, we have defined ourselves in terms of jobs and careers, not family, not organizations that we belong to, not the, the sort of culture in which we're embedded locally. What we've done is define our jobs as being what we're about. And in fact, if you meet somebody at a party, one of the first questions you ask them is, what do you do? And what, do you what do? you mean is, what is your job? Yep. Well, I think that what do you do question could mean something else. And John Maynard Keynes famously predicted a two-day work week. As productivity increased and real wages rose, even though wages might fall, prices would fall by more, he said – People and Mark Karl Marx said this also. You know, you would have so much time that you'll define yourself by something else. And people will find meaning in communities through Facebook. Through, in fact, you've done a couple of, of very nice podcasts recently about the ways that uh, people are able to find each other through uh, Instagram, through Flickr. Uh, we create these communities through hashtags and a you know, for a long time, it's been sort of face to face family. We meet for Thanksgiving. Oh, here's my brother in law. I don't really like him. I might be able to construct communities of meaning through other kinds of online platforms and become someone who is revered, respected and lovely because I have enough time and resources to do that. So I think people are going to construct meaning if we reduce the constraints on them. We talk about jobs as being important. Most people don't like their jobs very much. I love my job. I'm grossly overpaid and underworked. I have a wonderful time. Many, many people, and I've certainly had jobs like this, it's not that great. They'd quit in a minute and find something else that was more meaningful if they could. The question is, and you have raised it well, is this something that 
having a sort of sterile, guaranteed uh, stipend that comes from this impersonal entity, government, does that advance or retard that vision that I think we share about people constructing their own communities of, me- of meaning, which might or might not involve jobs? Yeah, that's very well said. I, I don't get to um, I don't get to read Franklin P. Adams very often on Econ Talk. Uh, Franklin P. Adams is a poet who was famous uh, for coining uh, making tinkers to Everest to chance. Famous the double play combination. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but his other somewhat uh, noted poem is called "The Rich Man," which I'm now going to read. It's short. The rich man has his motor car, his country and his town estate. He smokes a 50-cent cigar and jeers at fate. He frivols through the live long, live long day. He knows not poverty, her pinch. His lot seems light. His heart seems gay. He has a cinch. Yet though my lamp burns low and dim, though I must slave for livelihood, think you that I would change with him? You bet I would. And that's your – that's your uh, point about work. Work is <laughs> – it's uh, overrated. Um, yeah. You know, it's yeah. better to – it's uh, – you know, there's this other story. It's probably apocryphal um, uh, where, you know, some steel worker says to Teddy Kennedy, have you ever held a job? Uh, you ever you ever worked in a steel mill? You ever – and uh, – and Kennedy says no, and the steel worker says uh, you're you're lucky. You know it's overrated. It's it's <laughs> it's not. It does a better. I don't. I didn't tell that well. I forget how the actual wording's better. But the you raise a great point, which is you know there are other ways to get meaning in life. Perhaps uh, the idea that you support your family uh, used to be a male prerogative. It's no longer the case, and that's uh, whether it's a good thing or bad thing doesn't matter. That, that our world has changed. Yeah, Men gone. don't get the satisfaction that they used to from taking care of their family because women can take care of their family now yeah. uh, financially, and that's uh, changes culture and, and we all it evolves. I guess the question I have is that, and I and I take your point. I'll take both parts of it. One is I'm underworked and overpaid, and love my job, and I understand not everyone does, and not everyone needs to take care of their family or feel that they provide for their family anymore. But I'm not so sure that that's gone to zero for men or women. And I don't uh, know that if intervening in that emergent phenomenon through a very large program is the right way to help us get to a better world in the future. But it's been a provocative conversation. And do you want to say anything in closing? Well, the the last point that you raise, I think, may be the key one, and that is providing for my family is a combination of creating an environment of love and support and having time to do things together and providing the material things that my family needs. If we move a little bit more towards the first and away from the second, I think it will still be possible for people to provide for their families. My question is, what's the best way to accomplish this without suffering the admittedly corrosive effects of displacing these activities to an impersonal state? and getting away from the the focus on families. I happen to think that a big will help. I certainly understand arguments to the contrary. I think this is something we're going to have to deal with. My guest today has been Mike Munger. Mike, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.